In October 2015, Alexander Lukashenko was re-elected as president of Belarus. The result came as no surprise. Often described as Europe's last dictatorship, his regime is accused of suppressing all opposition. Glenn Ellis has been to find out more. It came as no surprise who won the presidential election in Belarus last October. The same man who has ruled the country for the last 21 years. With an economy in tatters and a long list of human rights violations to his name, Alexander Lukashenko presides over Europe's closest equivalent to North Korea. Time warped Belarus, a former republic of the Soviet Union, provides a glimpse into what life was like before the collapse of the USSR, where the secret police are still called the KGB, and even going to the theater could result in a prison term. Elections in such a utopia are rarely unpredictable, but even so, Russian support for separatists in neighboring Ukraine over the two previous years has rattled governments across the region. In the run-up to polling day, Belarus's jittery totalitarians were no exception. It's the day before the election, and Mykola Statkevich, the one man who could pose a real threat to Lukashenko, has called a rally. Following the last presidential election in 2010, street protests ended with a brutal crackdown. Thousands were arrested, some tortured. Statkevich was put on trial and spent almost five years in prison. He is barred from standing for president, despite massive public support. Elsewhere in the capital, Lukashenko's small team of paid supporters makes quite a contrast to the thousands who have turned out for Statkevich. But the president does have the backing of the KGB, the militia, and the army. <laughs> It's election day. And for many here, the child singers, cheap vodka, and discount vegetables are the main reason to come to the polling stations. Tatsyana Kartkevich was chosen by the opposition to stand against Lukashenko, one of only three sanctioned candidates. But it's all rather academic, as the result is a foregone conclusion. However, Tatsyana thinks that the actual support from the people will matter more than the inevitably forged official results. Indeed, although there are hundreds of election observers in the country, they are not allowed to observe the all-important counting process. You can see them behind the chairs, well away from the action. By evening, the mood is somber. Many fear that large-scale protests might arouse the unwanted attention of Russia's Vladimir Putin. Nonetheless, a small protest is taking place outside the headquarters of the Electoral Commission. 
not far away, a giant TV screen shows Lukashenko casting his vote with his 11-year-old son, Kolya, who many believe is being groomed to take over one day. Belarus's chief election commissioner, Lydia Yamoshna, is the subject of an EU travel ban because of her alleged role in rigged polls. It's no surprise when it is announced that Lukashenko has won. Outside Parliament, a lone 17-year-old is protesting. Before long, the militia arrive and drag this teenager away. But just how bad are things in Belarus? In a fair poll, opposition leader Mykola Stadkevich may well have won the elections in 2010 or 2015. Instead, he was banned from standing, sent to prison for almost five years, and his wife, driving home from a rare visit, narrowly survived an assassination attempt. To many people's dismay, the EU temporarily lifted sanctions against Lukashenko after the poll. Nevertheless, Statkevich remains defiant. Against this background, it might seem odd that there's a human rights NGO in Belarus. But there is. It's called Vyazna, or Spring. Vyazna may have had its offices confiscated. It may also have been outlawed. But somehow, its small team continues to agitate for change. And they certainly have their work cut out. Even demonstrating is an offense. But there are far worse things than a beating by the KGB. Belarus, the only European country with the death penalty, executes prisoners with a gunshot to the back of the head. Forced confessions and kangaroo courts are the order of the day. According to Vyazna and other international human rights groups, since Lukashenko seized power, over 300 individuals have been executed. Lubo Kavalova's son, Vladislav, like many, was picked up arbitrarily, charged, denied legal representation, badly beaten and tortured before signing a confession for a crime he did not commit. In this instance, the terrorist bomb attack in the Minsk metro in 2011. The guilty verdict and subsequent execution were condemned by international human rights groups and governments around the world, including the Kremlin. In fact, most observers believe the bombing and subsequent trial were a smokescreen to divert attention from the wrongdoings of the state. 
а это были выборы в декабре 2010 года, когда арестованы оппоненты Лукашенко, когда в тюрьму посадили тысячи людей. В тот момент уже начались процессы над предзаключенным. Живу, надеюсь, что вдруг это неправда. Когда откроется дверь и придет мой сын. Lukashenko's opponents say his disregard for human life is epitomized by his denial of the threat still posed by the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. This is the Chernobyl zone, a large area that spills over the border from Ukraine into Belarus, which took 70% of the fallout. The zone will remain badly contaminated for hundreds of years. Not surprisingly, many fled. This is just one of thousands of abandoned houses in the Kalinkovichi region. It is usually prohibited to film in the zone, but we went unnoticed. Despite the huge risks, there are people living here. For over a decade, Lukashenko's policy has been to repopulate the zone. Это очень опасно. И когда наш заявлял, давайте возвращаться на те территории, мол, что вы тут, там уже хорошо, безопасно, я вам даже финансово помогу, чтобы вы перебрались туда, это кощунство. Professor Grihor Lapin is the country's top expert on radiation. He worked in the zone for eight years, studying the effects on local people. He believes it's a ticking time bomb. То есть здесь все время идет вот такая возня за то, чтобы убедить всех. Да нет никакого Чернобыля. Все это чепуха. Это обман. Under Lukashenko's orders, previously abandoned fields in contaminated areas are being cultivated for purely economic reasons, part of a drive to make the zone profitable in a country already in desperate financial straits. But of course, it's the land that poses the biggest threat as radioactive elements find their way via the food chain into the human body, giving those who have returned a dangerous dose of radiation. Вот сегодня эти люди набирают эти дозы, у них меняется их система, меняются какие-то параметры, которые скажутся на их потомках. Despite a 45-fold increase in thyroid cancers among children, some live under the illusion created by the government that all is safe. Others are less optimistic, but with little help from the state and nowhere else to go, they have few options. Yulazimir Kashchenko is one of only a handful of survivors from the teams that went to work at Chernobyl when the reactor blew. Almost all are dead. Rather ominously, his name is already on the memorial. One of Lukashenko's first acts as president was to close down the ministry set up to help the victims of Chernobyl. Себя ставит выше этих людей. Он считает, что они свое отслужили, умерли, закопали, и все это нормально. As well as thyroid cancers, doctors point to soaring rates of prostate cancer 
and a steep rise in leukemia in the region. But once again, official policy is to deny any link to Chernobyl. It is perhaps unsurprising that Belarus has the highest suicide rate in Europe, along with the highest level of alcoholism. But take a look at Lukashenko's official website, and it would seem that things couldn't be any better. It shows the president smiling paternally below the national flag. There are endless feel-good photos of the 61-year-old Keep Fit fanatic, as well as videos showing him meeting other autocrats and bathing in the reflected glory of World War II veterans. His cult of personality is reminiscent of others. Эта система Лукашенко, она мая свои корони, мая своя свой подмурок на тем, что было створено еще у советские, у сталинские часы. Lukashenko nurtures the idea that Belarus is a Soviet utopia. Nowhere is this more evident than the newly opened National Museum of the Great Patriotic War. But Hitler isn't the only mustachioed dictator on display. Even here, it's hard to avoid Lukashenko and his heir apparent son, Kolya. School children are fed a diet of propaganda about World War II and the triumph of communism. It's all part of the propaganda machine. Any report which deviates from the official line is pounced on. Journalists are routinely charged or imprisoned. Yet somehow, they continue to work. This is Belsat TV, which operates out of a flat somewhere in Minsk. Here, journalists compile reports which are sent covertly to Warsaw in Poland and beamed back by satellite. If somebody has chosen the uh, work of journalists in countries such as uh, Belarus, he's a little bit crazy. Uh, we are beaten by police, we are detained by uh, special forces, uh, but we are finding our energy because we know we are working for our audience. They will not receive information if we will not do our job this day. We had a day when every flat of every worker was raided by secret police. Everything was confiscated. That day, we have managed uh, to make our main news in the evening on the borrowed uh, cellular phones. Lukashenko has had an equally toxic effect on the cultural life of Belarus, presenting Minsk as a communist paradise. In fact, Minsk is the cleanest capital in the world. Armies of unemployed, regardless of age and health, are forced to clean the streets to avoid paying a parasite tax, introduced earlier this year by Lukashenko to punish the unemployed. It's all part of a collective whitewashing. But some artists have come up with ingenious ways to evade state control. This is the Belarus Free Theatre. It was co-founded by theatre producer Natalia Koliada, who now lives in exile in England and helps coordinate performances remotely from London. We have an amazing group of people who work on the ground uh, in Belarus. So we come on Skype to say hello. And uh, those moments are very important to us personally over here. They put on clandestine performances in basements, warehouses, and even in the forests on the outskirts of Minsk. Audiences are texted 24 hours before a performance to meet at a secret rendezvous from where they are taken to the play. If everything is fine, then you will not be arrested. But uh, what happens very often, KGB park their cars where we perform, and uh, they will film audience and then they uh, start to blackmail you they might say that if you continue to go and uh, attend shows you will lose your education if you still go and see the shows your parents will lose their jobs 
Despite all of this, there's no shortage of people ready to take the risk. This brave audience was willing to be filmed. То, что мы делаем, естественно, это вызов, вызов для нас, прежде всего, как для актеров, и вызов для властей, потому что мы говорим на темы, на которые вообще не принято у нас говорить, запрещено. Но зачем молчать о том, что важно? Кто-то же должен говорить. This play deals with a period early on in Lukashenko's regime in the late 90s and early 2000s, when people who for one reason or another had angered the dictator were kidnapped, tortured and murdered, their bodies never found. <laughs> Not surprisingly, this play is banned in Belarus, where such crimes are committed. Alech Volchak heads a commission set up by the opposition to look into the disappearances. A former investigator in the prosecutor's office who investigated human rights abuses, Volchak was forced to resign shortly after Lukashenko came to power. И самое страшное, что к этому причастны не бандиты, не причастны какие-то там, ну, криминальные авторитеты, не причастна какая-то организованная международная преступность, вот, а именно белорусские спецслужбы и, ру и руководители страны, те, которые были. The disappeared include politicians, businessmen and journalists. Сегодня ситуация такова, что мы, люди в Беларуси, не защищены от, от таких спецподразделений, которые могут посреди белого дня нас побить, задержать, вывести в лес, к примеру, похитить. It is not only political activists who are cleaned away. Those who don't look clean enough for the clean streets of Minsk are never safe. Volchak has received chilling information that homeless people are being cleansed from the capital. Это держат, не держат, не знаю, пытают, не пытают, но по крайней мере периодически их вывозят куда-то. This disturbing story has been told by homeless people themselves. Alexei Shardra, a Catholic layman known by those he helps as Brother Luigi, is a trained nurse. He rescues elderly homeless people and takes them to a shelter he has set up. Вот, даже э, как-то я рассидел в доме в бедных, и они рассказывали между собой, что когда там кто-то приезжал в Белоруссию, там перед выбором бедных вывозила милиция за 150 километров, и их выкидывали ночью, зимой с машины, чтобы, чтобы они до Минска не добирались. Кому-то смолу на голову выливали, кого-то это водой обливали. Anywhere else, this man would be lauded as a hero, but not in Belarus. Brother Luigi has been repeatedly threatened by the KGB. И Асовик этот говорил, что ну закрывай дома, разгоняй всех хоть, и я дело закрою, и я вход его не пущу. Но я говорю, я людей выкидывать не буду, и я не буду закрывать дома. Поэтому говорю, я остаюсь до конца, говорю, верен Иисусу, говорю, я иду вперед. У меня дороги назад, говорю, нет. The future of the shelter is now uncertain. Back in the capital, Lukashenko has been inaugurated as president for a fifth term, promising to serve until the end of his days. With his re-election safely behind him, and with no apparent irony, Europe's last dictator again promised to live up to the responsibilities of his office. И оховывать правы и свобода человека и гражданина, заховывать и оборонять Конституцию Республики Беларусь.